Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Packers Unscripted. From Packers.com, I am Mike Spofford. That gentleman over there is Wes Hodkowitz. We're coming to you here from our studios at Lambeau Field. Wes, it's week 14, and we have plenty of Packers Bears to talk about, but I actually want to start this show talking about a specific individual on this 2021 Green Bay Packers team, and that is running back Aaron Jones, who we have found out in the last couple of days is both the Packers nominee for the Walter Payton Man of the Year Award as well as the Art Rooney Sportsmanship Award. Now, these are both awards that every team nominates one player, and then from those 32 nominees, one league-wide winner is selected at the end of the season. The Walter Payton Man of the Year Award is really the big one, though. Uh, um, this one is considered very prestigious. It's the it's the most prestigious award that the NFL gives out related to any sort of off-the-field endeavors for players. And um, anybody who has spoken about Aaron Jones this week, whether it's Matt LaFleur, whether it's Devontae Adams, any of his other teammates, no one can pick a more deserving nominee for the Walter Payton Man of the Year from the Green Bay Packers than Aaron Jones. I can't say it any better than Devontae Adams, so I won't even try to. But uh, Devontae's line yesterday was, this award was truly made for a guy like him, in addition to another number of other eloquent things that Devontae said. I felt like that was so true. Because there's been some incredible Man of the Year nominees the Green Bay Packers have had. Aaron Rodgers was a finalist in 2014. I right. think back to, you know, J. Rona Elliott, you know, uh, Corey Lindsley, Kenny Clark. You're talking about the creme de la creme of human beings that have walked into the Packers locker room. And since the day that Aaron Jones got drafted, the day that they pulled us all together and they back in the day when they used to walk in all the draft picks into the locker room the week afterwards for rookie minicamp and we would talk to guys. Yeah. You just got a feel of what this young man is like, who he is and what he represents. I've written a number of things on Aaron this week mostly because we found out there ended up being this bevy of awards that all got dropped on us in, in this time frame. <laughs> right. But, you know, y you understand how difficult 2021 has been for him. You know, he signs the contract that he's basically worked his 25, 26 years for, a life-changing deal with the Packers that secured his family's financial future. And before he can even have an opportunity to really savor that, he loses his father, Elvin Sr., after that battle with COVID. So in those moments, and I don't know what it's like to lose a parent, I can't even imagine what he was going through. I think that tests your will. It tests your, your makeup and constitution as a person. But in the Jones family's case, it, jorted, it sort of just refocused them on what their, their goals were. And Aaron talked this week about how him and his dad, when they went to the NFL Honors in 2019, they talked about Calais Campbell and his speech and what that represented him getting that award. And he felt like at that time, yeah, they were finding ways to give back, but they wanted to create a foundation. And he, he made that foundation with his twin brother, Elvin Jr. And just seeing how this family has persevered through everything, as much as words can say that this guy is selfless and he is a good person, I think it's in those moments of adversity that your true character gets revealed. And in Aaron Jones's case, I think we've learned a lot about him this year. Yeah, we absolutely have. And, and it's been everything from, and, and none of this that he necessarily wants a lot of attention for. Obviously, he wants attention on his foundation, the foundation with his brother and, and the charitable work that they're doing. But when you look at the, the things that have been in the media, whether it's giving you know the scooters to Brian Flea Engel's family because Flea went out and found Forget the locket in the in the grass yeah. at uh, um, after uh, uh, it had come off him on the touchdown run, and Flea was out there in the middle of the night and found it, and so uh, Aaron Jones wanted to do something for for Flea's family. So there's that, but at the same time, there's there is the foundation that he and his brother started. There's the free football camp in their hometown of El Paso, where all these kids can come for. Uh, you know, to, to learn football, learn some skills, have some fun, hang out with an NFL player, and yet they don't have to pay anything in order yeah. to do that. It's, it's, a, it, it's a free football clinic for the community. Go it was ahead. so cool hearing, because I had heard that. This is the fourth year they've done it, but it was in that press conference on Wednesday that Aaron actually mentioned 
the impetus for that was going back to his own childhood when Elvin Sr. paid out of pocket so him and Elvin could go to a football camp. Yeah, yeah. That, that where they came from, there wasn't an option for a free football camp. Not to mention having one where it's a Pro Bowl running back like him and Jamal Williams and all these guys with this amount of experience that were contributing. I thought that was a really interesting little add-on to that story of, of why it was so important to have a free football camp as opposed to just putting one on. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it's all these different things that, that we've seen and heard about Aaron Jones over the course of this year. And, it, and obviously there, there's been so much more about this year in particular because of his father's passing, but that's not to say that Aaron Jones is suddenly this different guy this year because of what his family has gone through. This is this is Aaron Jones. This is who he's always been. It's just been that much more in the spotlight now with him becoming a Pro Bowl running back. Um, you know, as you said, getting the new contract and, and all of the, the financial security that, that goes with that. All I'm really pulling for, and I normally don't invest a whole lot of emotion in this because I don't know a lot about the other 31 yeah. guys around the league. I'm really pulling for Aaron Jones to at least maybe make the finalist stage of this like Aaron Rodgers did seven years ago. As you said, we've seen a lot of really, really great Packers players get nominated for this. Corey Lindsley was last year's yeah. nominee, and he's the Chargers nominee here yeah. in 2021. So that, uh, that, that speaks to his work in the community as well. I'd like to see Aaron Jones make his way through this process a little bit and, and perhaps – draw that much more attention to his efforts, to his foundation, and, and the impact that he's making on other people. Yeah, and as you talked about earlier, the fact that he doesn't want the attention all shining directly on him, and, and Devontae Adams mentioned that in his presser as well, and as much as he loves Elvin Jr., everybody understands, you know, Aaron was the draft pick, right? He was the, the game changer at UTEP. I don't think a lot of people would have blamed Aaron, if he started a foundation and just wanted to be the Aaron Jones Foundation. He wanted to do it with his brother, though. He Because from day one, quite literally, that's been the guy right alongside him. And I thought it was interesting. He goes home on Tuesday after he gets this award, and they give him the little, the little trophy to signify that he was the Packers nominee. And, you know, his mom's there. And Vergas, you know, goes and puts the the trophy up right next to where Elvin's ashes are at Aaron's home. And after that, Aaron tells her, you know, thank you. To which she replied, well, what, what are you thanking me for? <laughs> and it, it, it shows you kind of the humility of that family because what he was thanking her for was a, a woman that served valiantly for her country for 28 years or whatever it was, you know, was away from them, was in Iraq, the, the, all these different things, but still always wanted to bring it back to the family, always wanted to support their family and I think when you look back to how difficult this year has been the only way you can really get through something like this is to hold closely together and again I, I thought that that said a lot about not only their family connection but the ties that bind them that you know that for everything that's happened in 2021 they're going to get through this thing in the end of it while not with Elvin Sr you know, as close as they've ever been as a family. Yeah, absolutely. Well, hats off to Aaron Jones for a well-deserved honor and hopefully not the last we are hearing about uh, this honor for him in 2021. West Sirius XM NFL Radio delivers hard-hitting analysis and up-to-the-minute NFL news that true football fanatics need 24-7, 365. And at Cousin Subs, we have something for everyone, like our Wisconsin cheese curds, mac and cheese, golden fries, and creamy shakes, all paired with your favorite sub or sub in a bowl. Cousin subs, we believe in better. All right, it is Packers-Bears, Sunday night football at Lambeau Field, week 14. The health situation for both teams, I don't know if you've got a sec to call up the uh, the injury report, um, because for both of the squads here coming into this, this is interesting. The Packers are coming off their bye week, and they're a little bit healthier than they have been. And we did also see um, on Wednesday the return to practice of Jair Alexander. So his window to potentially be activated um, to the 53-man roster is now open since he has returned to practice. But there are a lot of, uh, a lot of health questions here um, 
with this game looming on Sunday night, I think particularly with the Bears. So can you give us an update on where some of that Well, stands? it starts with David Montgomery because I just got done on Tuesday's episode talking about how this guy's the right. catalyst for the offense. You know, he's going to be the guy that really stirs the drink for them. And as it turns out, he's dealing with a shoulder, groin, and glute injury or injuries uh, coming out of that game last week against Arizona. Yeah. That's a huge thing. Because as I mentioned, one of my big qualifiers were was that when David Montgomery's healthy and he's right, I mean, this, is, this offense looks different. Apparently, he's not healthy right now again. So we'll see what the week looks like. You know, a lot of times, sometimes teams just want to sit guys down, give them a day or two to rest, and then they'll ramp them up at the end of the week. And Montgomery did miss the first, first Packers-Bears Correct. game this season. He was not the feature back for the Bears. We also did hear from Matt Nagy, Bears head coach this week announcing that Justin Fields will start. He has been cleared from the rib injury, and he will start against the Packers for the second time this year. So there, so the Packers will not be seeing Andy Dalton. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, Juice Herbert is the guy uh, in the backfield when Montgomery's been down. Obviously, Tarek Cohen's been out for most of the year. Right. Uh, but the, the th- last point I was going to make on Montgomery is, and, and he, may ve- he may be fine, we don't know yet, but... When it's three injuries, yeah. and especially two very different parts of the body, yeah. that is a little bit of a concern. But but looking at the overall picture, uh, you know, you also had some guys dealing with illnesses. Akeem Hicks has been banged up with the ankle. You know, Marquise Goodwin has the foot. Allen Robinson obviously returned coming off the hamstring. So they, they are beat up right now. And I think this is the difference between what you see. And just like how Green Bay's injury report was vastly different from the Rams when the Rams were coming off the bye. Right. Uh, it's the attrition. It's the way the season goes. But – if there is an issue there with Montgomery where he either can't go or he's limited, I think there is a, a big effect that that will have as far as the trickle-down domino uh, on this offense. Yeah, and the Packers are continuing to proceed with, at this point anyway, as of Wednesday afternoon, holding Aaron Rodgers out of practice, continuing to let that broken pinky toe heal. But Rodgers making it clear in, in the comments he made to the media that this is not a case of even though he's not practicing that there's some sort of a scaled down game plan or whatever that Aaron Rodgers wants the, you know, the full gamut of everything. Hey, you know, Matt, whatever you want to dial up, Hey, let's talk about it. Let's figure out what we like and, and, and let's go with it. This is not about, even though he's restricted in terms of his practice reps and his availability at practice, he doesn't go into the games feeling restricted. He's going to, he's going to leave it all out there both in terms of uh, in terms of the schematics and his play, as we've seen, he's not afraid to take off and run, right. even with uh, even with that toe bothering him. So, we'll see now, week to week. Rogers did say getting the entire getting an entire week off was extremely helpful for his toe. Um, he does hope that uh, it's going to continue to get better, and that maybe just maybe he will start getting back into a regular practice routine at some point. What, the, what this all reminded me of was I don't know if you've ever been in a position where you've had to throw the donut on your car because uh, your tire you know blew out on oh, you. Oh yeah, yeah. That's the way this kind of feels with Rogers in the toe. Like they have the tire ordered, they know that it's going to be there. You just got to hope that you that the, the donut stays you know intact here and you can just get to the finish line. Yeah. Uh, because as Rogers said, I mean, the, the problem with the surgery option is that he immobilizes the toe. They basically throw a pin in there, and then it's he's not going to be able to move that toe the rest of the year. It would reduce the chances of it getting any further fractured, but then there's the mobility side of it, right? Right. His hope is, and Doc McKenzie and everybody else, or I should say Doc Bob Anderson, everybody that has looked at this thing, their hope is that, okay, well, if you can just keep it healthy, do maybe not get stepped on anymore. <laughs> yeah, that would be good not to get stepped on like he has a couple of times already. But This yeah, thing go ahead. can heal up a little bit, but it's just the challenge of it. And as Rodgers, I think, told Pat McAfee, if, if they can get through this weekend healthy, you know, maybe next week is where it could potentially start to, to really start to feel the way he needs it to feel. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> as we had talked about on our last show, the Packers potentially could be taking the field on Sunday night with a chance to clinch the NFC North if the Vikings lose to the Pittsburgh Steelers on Thursday night football. There is also a scenario if the Vikings do win and stay alive in the division race, there is also a scenario where the Packers can clinch a playoff spot if both the Saints and the 49ers were to lose prior to the Packers taking the field Sunday night. But all that being said, I want to get to the keys to victory here. This is a Packers Bears game. Yep. It's a bit. It's a big rivalry game. 
Aaron Rodgers throughout the whole I own you thing at Soldier Field, which he said was directed at the fans, but you know how things can get taken in different ways. What do you think is the most important thing? What's at the top of your list for the Packers to win this game Sunday night? I let Insider Inbox on Thursday. You had to edit it with the statement that I don't care if it's Justin Fields. I don't (laughs) care if it's Andy Dalton. I don't care if it's Jim Miller, Shane Matthews, Shane Falco, whoever. (laughs) The Packers need to turn over the football defensively, and they need to stop the run. If David Montgomery is not playing in this, probably gets a little bit easier, although Juice Herbert had some decent games himself. I I think really it comes down to if if it is Justin Fields – to basically have that same game plan with some modifications of what they did earlier this season. You have to be able to limit him, you know, and make sure he doesn't scramble, make sure all that stuff, but just finding ways to keep the pressure on and force him into a few errors. I think if you achieve that, you keep this game in third and manageable, this game plays out the way it needs to play out. If, or third and distance, if it gets to be third and manageable, that's where it starts to get more interesting than it probably needs to be. I feel like if Green Bay stops the run, forces them into third and longs, those opportunities are going to be there to take the ball away and really control the tempo of this game. Yeah, and for me, quite honestly, Wes, the the whole key for me in this game is for the Packers just to not turn the football over on offense. While certainly some turnovers on defense could, could go a long way here, to me, this isn't a game the Packers necessarily have to win the turnover battle, but you just can't lose it. And if you don't turn the ball over on offense, you won't lose the turnover yeah. battle, right? I know I spoke on our last show when we were talking about the Vikings, and I brought up you know these two games for the Vikings, the types that you just can't lose when they lost to the Cowboys and they lost this past week to the Lions. I know this is Packers-Bears. I know it's a big rivalry. But with where the Bears are in their season, their injury report, with where the Packers are in their season and what's at stake and the fact that this is at home, under the lights, at Lambeau Field, this is one of those, quite frankly, that qualifies for me as a game. If you're the Green Bay Packers, you can't lose this game. Now, I'm not saying the Packers are going to win by 30. Spa thinks, you know, this is just some... That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying this is a game that if you're the Packers, you can't lose it. And I don't care if you win it by 3 or win it by 30. You just can't lose it. And to me... The quickest path to losing this game and to giving the Bears the shot at the upset is if you're turning the ball over on offense. If the Packers don't do that, I think they win this football game. I agree. And just come out and control the tempo. You know, whether you win the opening coin toss or not, if, if, if it's the Bears taking the field first, defensively shutting them down. If it's Green Bay, find a way to get those 10-play 75-yard drives and get into the end zone. This is such a great opportunity, Mike, and we've, we've expelled so much breath here uh, the last few weeks talking about the late by finishing three of five at home, the amount of division games they have with where everything stands in the North right now, the two game magic number, all that stuff. Yeah. As Devonte Adams said, there's an element of run the table to this. Now they're not running the table like 2016, where it was to make sure you at least make the playoffs, but they have a realistic shot at this number one seed. And if you look at yes, the way Arizona's schedule lays out, it's a little daunting for the Cardinals. So you have to take advantage of that, and it starts on Sunday against the Bears. Yeah, and I want to talk about some of those other games uh, on the slate this weekend in the NFL that, uh, that will impact the Packers. But I do want to throw out another plug for Cliff Crystal's history book. Packers fans, if you are looking for holiday gift ideas, team historian Cliff Crystal's book, The Greatest Story in Sports, is now available at the Packers Pro Shop. The four-volume hardcover book set tells the true, complete story of the Packers' first century from humble beginnings to heartbreaks and triumphs. Buy your copy online or in-store today. I gave, I gave Cliff so much well-to-do credit for everything on Tuesday's episode. Forgot to mention Aaron Popke, Katie Hermson, Tom Fanning, everybody else that was involved in this, the publisher of the book. Don't Can't remember what the name of the publisher is right now, but they <laughs> did a fantastic job with it. And I've already gotten multiple requests from family members to get this signed by Cliff Crystal, to get his John Hancock on that book. They want to have that forever. And, and, I want to uh, see it. and actually, for those who are in the area or are coming to the game, Cliff is doing a book signing at the Packers Pro Shop on Saturday afternoon this weekend. So for a Just, couple of hours in the afternoon, yeah. stop by and get a copy of the book and get it signed by the author. Just books, though. No babies. No, no, he's not no, signing babies. No babies, no memorabilia. Okay, I think right. it's just, I think just it's the just book. for the, just right. for the book. Um, 
Other games to keep an eye on, I already mentioned the Steelers-Vikings game on Thursday Night Football and the implications that will have as far as the NFC North race. But other ones to watch here, Wes, a really interesting, I think really interesting game in the NFC East. Dallas is at Washington. Washington is coming on strong. The Cowboys obviously still leading that division. I believe they have a two-game lead yep. in the division. Yeah, two-game lead. That's their competition. Two-game lead over Washington. So Washington looking to cut that deficit in the NFC East to one game. Another one to watch, it will be on, I believe it's essentially the national late afternoon game prior to the Packers-Bears in primetime. Buffalo is at Tampa Bay. The Bills coming off of the short week, the tough loss to division rival New England when the Patriots just ran and ran and ran the ball in the bad weather. But Tampa Bay... A 9-3 and three team looking to stay with just the three losses as both the Packers and the Buccaneers trying to keep the pressure on the Cardinals. And then Monday Night Football in the NFC West, you have the Rams are at Arizona. Now the Cardinals won the first matchup between these yep. two teams in Los Angeles. So this is the rematch. It's in Arizona. Monday Night Football, obviously Packers fans will be looking to see if the Arizona Cardinals take a third loss. They are the team sitting in the catbird seat right now at 10-2. and two. Arizona's going to take a third loss, so the Rams are going to take a fifth loss kind of out of nowhere yeah. uh, with the way that their season is headed. So, yeah, we know we've talked about said nauseam, the NFC West. There's It's going to be right down to the wire. There's a lot of competition there, not only for the division title, not only for the, the conference, uh, you know, being able to get a bye or anything like that. There's also the fact that a number of these teams are trying to make the postseason. The game I am most infatuated with, though, is that Dallas-Washington matchup because Washington, they hung their hat on their defense a lot last year. Well, you don't have Chase Young. Now Montez Sweat is going to miss at least two games. Right. That, that big, bad offense, defensive front we were talking about with all those first-rounders, it's been chipped into a little bit. Yeah. And Dallas, you know, it looks like Tony Pollard now dealing with a foot injury. Ezekiel Elliott's been up and down, but he may be the guy that has to go. He was a full participant in practice on Wednesday. That they got to get Zeke going again. That's going to be the big key for them down the stretch. Can they do it against a, a really you know formidable Washington defense that is also kind of struggling a little bit on the injury front? Buffalo's got to get a win. They just got to do it. Uh, they're trending in the wrong direction right yep. now. Yes, I know Monday night was a weird, weird game, an anomaly, some game you're only going to play in once every ten years. But it was a it was a costly loss for them costly against loss. against their division yep. rival against New England when they had them at, at home. Those those are the types of games that that are that are tough to and lose. And we talked about the Packers building a cushion. So that as disappointing as that game was against Minnesota, yeah. they had some leeway there to make a mistake. Buffalo is they've lost too right. many of those games. They don't have that. Right and. As you mentioned, with regard with regard to the Cardinals, they do have a pretty tough schedule here down the stretch because they also have a game against the Cowboys, and I'm trying to remember they have another Indianapolis. One. Yes, they have the Colts. Like I knew Indianapolis it was, I knew it was a tough. cross conference. Yeah, Indianapolis. Besides that loss to Tampa Bay, has won like five of six. Yeah, and they found out that they have Jonathan Taylor. It's not just West that doesn't know that Jonathan Taylor is a good <laughs> running back. The Indianapolis Colts are starting to figure it out too. Yeah, no, the the so the Cardinals the Cardinals definitely have a tough schedule. To me, the opposite opposite is the Tampa Bay Buccaneers because if the Buccaneers don't take a fourth loss against the Buffalo Bills this week I think that is going to be the signal to the Packers that you have to run the table mm -hmm. to have a shot at the one seed because based on the Buccaneers schedule I believe it's two games against the Panthers one against the Saints and one against the Jets I don't see the Buccaneers losing any games in those last four. Yeah. So this one against Buffalo, if the Buccaneers are going to take a fourth loss and give the Packers a little bit of leeway, if you want to look at it that way, which is, you know, no, dicey. Right. But if the Buccaneers are going to take a fourth loss, it's going to be here. And if they beat Buffalo, I think the Buccaneers are running it, which means the Packers have to run the table and at least stay even with the Buccaneers because – the tiebreaker between those two would be conference record, and the Packers have the edge there because one of Green Bay's losses was to Kansas City in the AFC, just throwing that out there if you've been following all this. Yeah, absolutely, and that's the thing that kind of stinks about this whole deal too is that like you sort of forget that the cross-conference, the interconference battle for Green Bay this year was the AFC North because of the game against Kansas City and these different things that have happened now. So Packers still got two good games coming up against a decent you know, Browns team and a Baltimore team that I think has shown that they can play with anybody. So Absolutely. you can't let up. You have to take care of business in the division. You have to take care of business in the other, uh, the other North division as well. And 
and hope that maybe, you know, Tampa Bay slipped up once against New Orleans. Could they potentially do it again, too, in addition to whatever happens against the Bills? Yeah, all right. Well, with that, we will call it a wrap on this edition of Packers Unscripted. Be sure to follow all of our coverage of the team, all of the coverage of Sunday's big Packers-Bears game from Lambeau Field. We'll have it all for you on Packers.com. For Wes, I am Mike. Thank you for tuning in, everybody. We'll see you next time. Thank you.